We are in uh, a series at the moment called Burnt, and we're looking at some of the reasons that people have, give, have given or do give, uh, some of the most common reasons people give for leaving a church, leaving the church, or abandoning the faith altogether. And we've looked at, I mean, a, a stack so far, some where there's been perhaps a misunderstanding, where we haven't actually been very clear with what it is that we stand for or believe, either with our words or with our lives. Some, uh, the, the gospel is just unpalatable, intrinsically offensive. Uh, <clears throat> some has been just because of the, I mean, sometimes bad, sometimes negligent, sometimes just downright evil actions of people who are claiming the name of Jesus. Uh, we're going to, I know I said this for the last two weeks in a row, we're going to look at church abuse today, uh, but Harold got COVID, so he's not going to be able to preach tonight. So hopefully next week is the hope uh, that we'll finally get to that. Um, but today, we I mean, the topic is not, I mean, it is very, it is very different. It's not, it's not about abuse at all. Uh, but it is one of the ones that consistently has come up in the last 30 or so years in the top five or seven reasons that people give for this is why I've either I've given up on church, I still might have a faith, but I've given up on church, or <clears throat> I've given up on Christianity altogether. And that is because of the issue of the church being full of hypocrites. Church is full of hypocrites, so I left the church. Or oh, church is full of hypocrites, so I, how can I believe anything that they say? That's what we're looking at today. Um, just a few notes on this. I did a quick autofill on Google. Uh, why are Christians, let's see what comes up with Google. Number one was, why are Christians being persecuted, which I was very surprised about. Number two, why are Christians so judgmental? Um, and I, uh, on Twitter yesterday, I actually saw in the last week or so, um, there's been a bit of controversy around the role of chaplains in schools, specifically in the eastern states, but across, across the country. Um, someone uh, wrote an article about it, which a, a, a Christian, like a, a, actually it was a really good article, I thought, answered, well, here's a few reasons why um, chaplains are actually awesome in schools. And, but after that good article was written, the author of the original article uh, posted a tweet saying, I have just received the most uh, horrific abuse from people about this article that I wrote. And some of the responses to her comment was, that's Christian love for you right there. Or Christians are wonderful inside, aren't they? Another one said, how very Christian of them. Who needs haters when you have Christians love? And uh, the, the author wrote, well, actually it wasn't a, a Christian. It was, uh, they call it a right-wing nut job, which was a new phrase for me. Um, <clears throat> But all this to say that the, it seemed like the majority of people assumed it was Christians and that assumed that Christians would be, although professing love, would actually be spewing hate. There's a recent survey conducted of adults who don't attend church, not even on holidays. So non-Christians, non-churchgoers, not even like Christmas and Easter, like nominal Christians, and have found that. 72%, so almost three in four people outside the church looking in thought of the church as being full of hypocrites. Nearly three in four said of the church, full of hypocrites. And yet, more than that, 78% of them said they'd be willing to listen to someone who wanted to share their beliefs about Jesus. The same number of people, the same percentage, 72%, who said they think the church is full of hypocrites, also said, I have a belief in God. <clears throat> but they're not going to the church to find out anything more about this God in whom they believe because the church is full of hypocrites. They'd be willing to hear someone talk about Jesus but not willing to go to church because it's full of hypocrites. And is this familiar to anyone? Has anyone come across this? Either in your, you know, you don't have to say yes. This is more of a rhetorical question, but you can answer eternally if you like. Uh, I've heard this, even in our church back in the early days, uh, back when we were uh, predominantly a young adult church. I was in my 
early 30s when we first started this church 10 years ago. And uh, the average age of the church for the first maybe 150 people would have been about 22 years of age. And one young bloke came to me one day. He'd been around the church community for a little while. Uh, Not a Christian, um, but uh, really seeking. And he said, "Uh, I don't think I'm going to keep coming to church because I see my friends, not just here, but predominantly old school friends he knew from a bunch of different churches around the place. So they come to church on a Sunday and lift up their hands. Uh, But I was out drinking with them and hooking up with people last night, and then they come here in the morning, and they, they pretend to be Christians. And then they go out into their week, and they just do whatever they want to do, and then they come back. And he said, and I, and he said you know, you, you keep talking about be a truth pursuer, and I'm not seeing the truth pursued in people's lives. And I was like, yeah, because we're a bunch of hypocrites, mate. The Bible has a lot to say about hypocrites. Jesus has a lot to say about hypocrites. Uh, <clears throat> first of all, I want to pray just to help us kind of prepare our hearts and, and soften our spirits to the Holy Spirit and to his scriptures tonight. Uh, and then we'll dive into it. See, where is the accusation that Christians are hypocrites or the church is full of hypocrites? Where is that true? And man, it is, it is true. Uh, maybe not for every individual person, but... For the church in Australia, it is, it's true. Uh, I might see maybe what are some antidotes and how might we be a better witness um, for these people who have left the church or abandoned the faith or the hypocrisy of the church has prevented people who otherwise would love to find out about this God in whom they have some belief or, or some acknowledgement that there is a God and yet won't go to Christians because of the hypocrisy of the church. So let's pray I do want to get stuck into like the heap of scripture that talks about hypocrisy um, and see what God would have for us today. Father, again, just want to thank you for your scriptures. We, we want to be people of the truth, not people who say one thing and do another or say we believe something, but our lives show that we don't. And so help us. Um, Lord, form us and shape us by your scriptures, by your spirit tonight. Help us to become more like Jesus, to speak like him, love like him, forgive like him. Uh, Lord, where we have <clears throat> been hypocrites personally or, or communally, um, we, just, we repent of that. Where we haven't represented you well to the world, I'm I'm sorry. And so help us today, again, to become more like Jesus, in whose name we ask. Amen. So what is a hypocrite? We better actually look at what it is before we you know, really delve into <clears throat> looking at how, you know, the accusation of us being a hypocrite. Uh, hypocrite, this word in Australia, I think at least from my perspective, in Australia, in our culture, is one of the worst insults you could levy at someone. So to say to someone that you are a hypocrite in Australia... That's it. You're pretty low, actually, uh, on the totem pole if you are a hypocrite or known to be a hypocrite. We don't have time for hypocrites in Australia. The word hypocrite comes from a Greek word. Uh, Jesus used this word a lot, and it's the Greek word for an actor, someone who wears a mask, someone who pretends to be something that they're not or says they're one thing in one context but is another thing in another context. So like we would use the word actor or pretender is the way that Scripture uses this word hypocrite. Somebody who wears a mask specifically was the connotation uh, as we read it in in Scripture. And his way to think about hypocrisy is when you profess something that you don't possess. You profess it with your mouth or with your words that you don't possess with your life and with your actions. Jesus had a lot to say about hypocrisy. He reserved his most striking criticism and condemnation for the hypocrites, for especially the religious scribes and Pharisees, those who would have been in the the church of their day, uh, studying the scriptures, 
trying to, in some sense, at least live up to those scriptures, Jesus had the most stinging rebuke for them, and then he said, you are pretenders. He called them whitewashed tombs. So from the outside, you're beautifully painted, you look nice, but on the inside you are dead bones on the inside. It's not, what's on the inside is not the same as what is being professed. The hypocrites of Jesus' day proudly displayed their piety, their holiness, their righteous deeds in public, but inwardly they were far from God. Here are some of the things Jesus called out as hypocritical. Just, I mean, it's not a small list. He said, giving to the poor to be recognized by others, call them hypocrites. Praying in public to be recognized as God's man, hypocrites. They used to like pray loudly in front of others so that people would look at them and go, wow, what a holy person. Look at their phenomenal prayers, hypocrite. <clears throat> Letting everyone know that they were fasting to get recognition by others. So Jesus said, when you fast, don't do what the hypocrites do, where they're in ash and, and sackcloth and ash and sunken faces and going around like, oh, I'm so hungry. Oh, I'm so hungry because I'm holy and fasting. Oh, I'm so hungry. He said, hypocrites, pretenders, no holiness there at all. Um, pretending to honor God through lip service only, complaining about others' behavior when theirs was worse, testing other people to make themselves look superior, deceiving people from knowing God, repressing the poor and widows, teaching converts to be hypocrites, tith- so giving money, tithing to the church, but neglecting the more weighty measures of the law like justice and mercy. Jesus so called all of these people and people who practice these things hypocrites, <clears throat> doing everything for show while really being self-indulgent and unrighteous. Hypocrites, treating animals better than fellow human beings. Hypocrites. And being able to look at the sky and determine the weather for the next day but being unable to distinguish between right and wrong, Jesus called these people hypocrites over and over and over again. Actors, pretenders, hypocrites, specifically to the most religious of the day. So, one more thing. Matthew 24, Jesus shows us that God will judge the hypocrites. Matthew 24, 51. That God is more angered by hypocrisy from those claiming to represent him and yet represent him falsely than the ones who rejected Jesus because of the hypocritical Christians. He says it would be better for you to tie a heavy stone around you and cast that stone off a cliff into the water and drown than to cause one of these little ones, in your hypocrisy to stumble. He was biting against hypocrites because hypocrisy is incredibly, incredibly destructive to where even in our day we can look at these, just just the data, let alone the anecdotal stories that we know of people who have walked away from the faith or from church because of hypocrites. We see it even in the data that the same number of people who think the church is full of hypocrites believe in a God but can't find any more information about him because it won't go to the ones who know him or won't go to the ones who know him. Who are the hypocrites? Are you a hypocrite? Am I a hypocrite? What does the Bible say? The Bible says, yeah, we're, actually we are hypocrites. Which from an Australian perspective, just to hear someone say you're a hypocrite is like, oh, that's so stinging in our culture because we don't want to be a hypocrite. What does Scripture say, Isaiah 9? Everyone is a hypocrite. Everyone is an evildoer. Every mouth, and every mouth speaks folly. There's no escaping it. Because we all, we all do it. None of us lives up to, let alone do we not live up to God's righteous requirement. We don't even live up to our own requirements and our own rules and our own hopes For ourselves, let alone living up to God's righteous requirements. If it makes you feel any better, even Paul, he writes a a big swathe of the New Testament. He writes to the Roman church and he says, I know how you feel. I don't do the things that I do want to do and I do the things that I don't want to do. 
It's like, I'm a hypocrite too. That's not true. I, I should say, that's not to try to make us feel better. We, we don't want to be hypocrites. Christians shouldn't be hypocrites, actually. Not, at least not in the way that our culture perceives us as being hypocrites. Culture looks in from the outside into the Christian church and sees a bunch of people that say, I'm better than you and you are evil. You should be more like me. This is what people think Christians believe. And then when they see Christians behaving poorly, they say, see, you hypocrites. You think you're better than me? You think you're better than us? You've somehow climbed this moral threshold and from your perch from up on high, you look down on the rest of us with your moral superiority. This is how people perceive Christians because we've done a terrible job collectively of clearly articulating the gospel and then living it out. It's not their fault that they think that we're hypocrites because they think the gospel is be a better person. They think the gospel is come and study these scriptures and you'll discover the, the secrets of life, unlock them, level yourself up and become a better person. And as you become a better person, some sort of uh, karmic thing happens where because you're better, you're going to be healthier and you're going to have a better off life. And the, the, the issue or the the devastating part of it is that there are Christians who say these things, or people who claim Christ, who have a terrible understanding of the gospel. It's our fault both in not communicating the truth and the beauty of the gospel with our words, and then it's also our fault <clears throat> for not backing up when we do communicate the gospel clearly, we don't back it up with our lives. Like old mate from the early day of early days of the church, who's like, well, these people say that Jesus is their Lord on a Sunday morning or Sunday evening, but then Saturday evening Jesus isn't their Lord, and Monday morning Jesus isn't their Lord. Even if they can articulate the gospel well, it has no meaningful presence or power or application in their lives because we're hypocrites. But. The message of the gospel isn't, I figured it out. Come climb the moral threshold with me. Balance out your karma so that God has to give you good things and good circumstances and health and wealth and prosperity. That's not the gospel at all. This is part of the gospel is this. There is, this, this is Paul again writing, there is no distinction. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood, we'll look into this in a little bit, uh, to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. It's what Scripture consistently tells us. What the gospel is consistently is not, oh, Christians, you're, you're better. You've figured it out. And from our, our lofty moral perch, we look down on everybody else, telling them to come and be more like us. No. The gospel is, uh, actually, we are all hypocrites, like Isaiah tells us. We, we all are guilty of evil. We are, in our own natural state, all enemies of God. All of us. All of us have unclean hearts. All of us, again, left to our own natural devices and our own uh, works of righteousness, un completely unable, utterly unable to please God. There's nothing of our own that we could possibly muster up in an entire lifetime to bring to God and say, here's what I've done for you that would be worthy or acceptable in his eyes because we're his enemies. Accept that because of God's great love for us. Jesus became, is just, he is holy, he is perfect and blameless, and justifier through faith in his blood. This propitiation by his blood uh, means that everyone who is an enemy of God, us, we in our natural state, <clears throat> apart from 
the love of God on us. We are his enemies and his good and just and righteous wrath remains on us and is directed on us, stored up for the time of judgment. But Jesus' propitiation by his blood means that he has himself absorbed that wrath. But there's no more wrath for you. And it's not like Jesus has tamed or calmed an angry, vengeful God, but that God, because of his love, sent Jesus to take the judgment we deserve so that he could be just, so that there's no sweeping sin under the rug. There's no, there's no saying, well, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. And, and therefore, justice isn't done. But Jesus himself received the judgment or took upon himself the justice that we rightly deserved so that he could be just, remain just, and justify us. It's a very different gospel to, hey, I'm a very good person. Be a better person like me. The gospel is, hey, I didn't, I didn't figure something out because I'm, I'm spectacularly intelligent or because uh, of who, the family I was born into. We, we've got all of the secrets, the secret knowledge. Not at all. It's because of his great love for us. Received by faith. This is why, I don't know if you've heard this before, I've, I've heard this a lot. Uh, well, this, this person I know, uh, this lovely person, my, my mum, my cousin, the, again, the proverbial little old lady down the road, she's more Christian than most Christians I know. And what the person means by this is, well, to be a Christian is to be a very good person, right? And, and a better person than other people, more moral. And again, sit atop your moral perch and look down at everybody else. And this little lady, she is more moral than most people I know. Therefore, she's most, more Christian than most Christians I know because the Christians I know are hypocrites. And although, although they proclaim love, they keep doing evil, sinful things. But to say this person who doesn't know Jesus is more Christian than most Christians I know is to fundamentally misunderstand the gospel. Because to be a Christian isn't to be a better person. Christianity isn't you were a bad person, now you're a good person. Christianity is you were a dead person, and I was a dead person in my sin, but I've been, a, I've been made alive in Christ because of his great love for me. It's very different. The gospel isn't, oh, you, you bad person, be good like me. It is, hey, fellow dead person, fellow enemy of God like me. Do you know God has made a way? to deal with all of your rebellion and sin and unrighteousness. Well, you don't have to try to work your way up to God. He has reached down to you. He wants to breathe life into your lifeless body. He's dealt with all of your sin. He's dealt with all of your shame. He's dealt with all of your guilt. And in Jesus, he has himself suffered the penalty that you justly deserve. So there's now nothing that separates you from the love of God right now and for all of eternity with him. It's very different to what our culture says, which is <clears throat> uh, you've got to make it. You've got to pull yourself up by your bootstraps. You've got to You've got to be a better person. And so when Christians buy into this non, non, no gospel at all, they try to project an image of themselves as having it all together, of having no weakness, of having no sin, of being the proverbial better person. But then as people get to know you better, they see, well, you're actually, you're not the same person out there, the actor is not the same as the person but down here, and so what you do is you don't let anybody see your struggles or your weakness or your sin because you're trying to project an image of your awesomeness to the world and it is debilitating and it's crushing and it, it wears you down and it's not the gospel. There's no joy found there. The Christian life is entirely about undeserved favour. Entirely about undeserved favour. 
So why would we pretend or try to project, project ourselves to be better than we are when God has already dealt with our sin? Like, he's, he's already dealt with all of this, the, the mess and the stuff and overcome all of that, all of the mess of our lives, all of the rebellion and the sin and the, the evil in our hearts with his own love. Why would we pretend to have it all together in a community where the chief, like the core tenet of our faith, the gospel, is an acknowledgement that we can't do it by ourselves? That apart from the work of the Spirit to bring faith and the saving work of Jesus on the cross, we're unable to produce works of righteousness. Why, why would we be the pretending people? No, our, our culture is the culture of pretense. I can't tell you how many people I know on social media who, if you look at their social media, have really wonderful lives. I don't mean idyllic lives. Uh, through my old job working in media, uh, knowing some very famous, like lots of follower kind of people, uh, and seeing the image of their lives that they project in front of everyone else and seeing what happens when they're not in front of a camera and seeing the disparity between those two lives and the hypocrisy of those lives and then seeing people who look at those people's lives and go, wow, I wish my life was like that. And then they pretend as well because that's what you need to do because how could I admit that my life doesn't, isn't as idyllic and as amazing as this person's life and the culture is actually in this kind of whirlpool sinking down to despair and this kind of crushing weight of trying to project a vision of yourself that has no basis in reality. Anti-gospel. <clears throat> What's the antidote to hypocrisy? The antidote is we don't hide our, sh our shortcomings, but rather we boast in them. This is what Paul writes uh, about how do we put the gospel on display. Like if the gospel is core to our life, the gospel is the power unto salvation, how do we put the gospel on display in our lives? We don't hide our weakness like our culture does. We bring it into the light. This is what Paul writes, 2 Corinthians. On my own behalf, I won't boast, except in my weakness. He does a small humble brag. He says, though if I should wish to boast... I wouldn't be a fool for I'd be speaking the truth, but I'll refrain from it so that no one may think more of me than he sees in me or hears from me. So to keep me from becoming conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from becoming conceited. He says, man, the message that I've received and the works God is doing in me and through me is so amazing. I could boast about it if I wanted to. I'd be right to do so, but I won't do so. But also so that I wouldn't become conceited with the amazing things God is doing through me. God gifted me a thought in the flesh. It says three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in weakness. So Paul says, therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. So our culture, and we have, to our detriment and to the detriment of our witness, we've bought into this I mean, deadly culture of trying to hide our weakness and present our strength. And the times when we do present our weakness is when we have gotten past it. This is, this is such a stupid thing that we do as Christians. When we're having a difficult time, we retreat from Christian community because we want to project an image of having it all together because surely that's what God's blessing looks like, right? And if I'm weak, if I'm broken, if I'm struggling with sin, then obviously I'm not an overcomer. Even though Paul writes in Romans 8, uh, it's in our weaknesses and in our persecutions that we are more than conquerors, but that's another sermon. Uh, we try to hide away from these things, and then when we have overcome them, 
then we can come back to our Christian community and say, oh, praise God, I overcame this struggle. I overcame this weakness. I overcame this addiction. It is uh, it's foolishness. Where is the power of God? My power is made perfect in weakness. And my grace is sufficient for you. And so don't hide <clears throat> your weakness. Paul says, I'm not going to boast about the great things God is doing in me, although he does boast about those things for the, for the glory of God. He says, I'm going to boast in my weakness because when I bring my weakness into the light and show you my weakness, then what I'm really doing is showing you that God is the power. That it's not because of me. It's not because I'm intelligent and figured it out. It's not because I climbed the moral threshold and got over this kind of karmic high jump. Uh, it's none of those kinds of things. I haven't twisted God's arm, figured out, again, some sort of cosmic loophole. It's because of the grace and the goodness and the power of God in me. So that's why we need to bring our weakness into the light. That's why we need to show and bear one another's burdens, like he writes to the Galatians, and so fulfill the law of Christ in giving our burdens to one another and bearing the burdens of each other. How can we do that if no one is sharing our, sharing our burdens? Hypocrites. We've got to do it. The power is in our weakness. And we, we uh, leave or, or don't take hold of this access we have to the power of God because we're unwilling for people to see our weakness. <clears throat> we're unwilling to take hold of the power in our, in our witness to those who don't know Jesus because we don't want them to see our weakness. Somehow th thinking that we're going to be either making ourselves look bad or making God look bad because we're, we're weak. That's, that's the opposite of the gospel. The gospel is we were dead in our sin. We were unable in our own right to muster up works of righteousness, to earn God's affection or attention, but that he's gifted us great favor, unsearchable, bottomless riches, even union with himself in our union with Christ. Like how unfathomably honored are we to be brought into union with the holy, perfect one of heaven. And we try to hide our weakness. When we hide our weakness, we hide the power of the gospel. We actually say, no, no, we can do it. Well, I'm righteous. How do we avoid hypocrisy? I've got seven ways. I've got to try to rip through them, but it's worth thinking about. Number one, apply the gospel in your life. The gospel is the power unto salvation. Absolutely. But it's also the power for life today. Understanding and applying the gospel prevents us from becoming conceited when things are going really well and prevents us from being crushed when things are going poorly or when we just can't seem to break through uh, and overcome this sin or when all circumstance seems to be going to crap the gospel reminds us of God's love for us. And when we're doing awesome in life, the gospel helps us from becoming conceited and just shows us again our desperate need daily of a saviour and our total un inability uh, apart from the Holy Spirit in us and Christ's finished work applied to us to do any work pleasing to God. <clears throat> So be open with your struggles. Bring them into the light. Boast in them. Show people your weakness and show people how God meets you in your weakness. Confess your sin to one another and show how God has come and covered over all of his sin. We don't, the, the frustrating part of it is we are the people who don't need to hide our sin from each other. 
Because we're the ones who know we are sinners. We're the ones who, that's the, like the foundation, actually. It's the, well, after God's love, God's love foundation, the next thing is we don't deserve his love because we're sinners. Why would we hide our sin from each other when we're the ones who know we're sinners? And God has overcome our sin. When one of the, uh, in, again, in the early days of uh, planning of the church, <clears throat> um, we immediately broke into discipleship groups. One of our uh, discipleship groups, uh, I, I, uh, an older gentleman who I really respect came and visited one of those groups one day and uh, came to me the next day and said, oh boy, you've got a big problem in your church, Don. The, in this group, all these guys are just talking about the sins that they're struggling with. It's just really, like, that's it's unbelievable that they would talk about these sins so freely. Like, they're, they're real sinners. And my comment was, yes. Absolutely, and they're bringing those sins into the light. Like the, the disinfecting power of bringing them into the light, exposing them so that they could see the gospel at work in their lives. It's actually it's so countercultural. And he was like, oh, yeah, Every, everyone should be like that. How freeing it is to actually be known, to not just be known as the veneer, and I have to protect and carefully curate, curate this veneer, lest anyone see behind and just live in perpetual fear that someone's going to see behind the mask and see to the real you. Oh, put, it, put all that aside, folks, please. Apply the gospel every day. Lay down those masks. Lay down the veneer. Be known. Be known and not judged. Because everyone you confess to is also a sinner, once an enemy of God, radically saved by grace. We're all in it together. We looked at this last week. Uh, there's, there's no comparison of, of kind of righteousness in our own self-righteousness. That, that spectrum is just a line. And we're all on it. And Jesus is the only one who lives a perfect life, let alone any modicum of self-righteousness. And he imputes to us his righteousness so that we don't have to pretend to have our own. Secondly, don't judge someone who doesn't have the Holy Spirit expecting them to live as a Christian. Paul writes this to the Corinthian church. He says, what do I have to do with judging outsiders? What would I expect somebody who doesn't have the Holy Spirit, doesn't know the love of God, why would I expect them to live like you have been called to live and you who does have the Holy Spirit, who does know the love of God, you still struggle to live a life worthy of the gospel and you're expecting me to judge these people outside? No, we don't judge people outside. We are not high on a moral perch looking down on sinners in culture. That's not our disposition towards those around us. We are, we were fellow captives who have been plucked out of the kingdom of darkness and brought into the kingdom of light, into union with Christ. And our plea as ambassadors of Christ is be reconciled to God. Fellow captives. I didn't figure it out because of my awesomeness. I didn't earn it because I'm amazing. God's love found me and God's love is pursuing you. Come and receive his mercy and his grace. That's our call. That's our cry. If God hasn't done any internal convicting, you're judging your harshness. I'm not saying don't present the truth. I'm saying your harshness, your, your like, criticism will only come across as unloving if God doesn't do a work. Thirdly, if you're going to compare, and I don't recommend you compare, but when you do, compare weakness with weakness. Don't look at someone else's awesome Instagram, uh, TikTok, Facebook, whatever, whatever else, that is carefully curated and looks amazing and compare their highs of highs to your lowest internal hidden lows. It's crushing. Don't compare at all. 
Don't compare at all. And certainly don't compare your highs, the, the best of what you do, or the, your intentions when you fail with someone else's failure and weakness. If we're going to compare, Paul helps us again in Corinthians, if we're going to compare ourselves, we compare ourselves to Jesus. And like he writes to the Romans, we have all fallen, sin, uh, fallen short, all of us. We tend to view other people's sin as worse than our own because we can justify our own. But Jesus clearly calls this hypocrisy again. He says, you hypocrite, Matthew 7. First take the log out of your own eye. Then you'll see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Fourthly, view others with a lens of the gospel, like we just mentioned, 2 Corinthians. From now on, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. You're a new creation. You've been given a new heart. You've been given a new life. And you've been given new eyes. We don't view God like we did before as a harsh judge. We don't view him as a distant deity. We view him not as an enemy ruler. We view him as a loving father. And we don't view one another in the same way that we viewed each other before. We are, those of us united with Christ, we are brothers and sisters, sons and daughters of God Most High. And we view others as fellow captives of former fellow captives in desperate need of a saviour. Not as enemies, not as obstacles to our preferred vision of of our future life, but as people Jesus has sent us to, to tell them about his love and then to live a life congruent, congruent with the message that we have. Fifth, Empathy, put yourself in others' shoes. Don't have time to go into it, but it's pretty self-explanatory. Six, acknowledge you're just not very good at judging. As humans, anthropologically, psychologically, we have this innate view of ourselves as being experts at viewing, having perspective on what's going on around us. In reality, we're terrible at it. Shockers, actually. So when you come to judge... Acknowledge that you have a greater confidence in your ability to judge than you have competency in your ability to judge. Man, I wish I'd go into that further. Let's talk about that later. Number seven, maybe over dinner we could talk about this. Uh, number seven, and finally, act in a way that's congruent with what you believe. Actually, let your life look like your words and the beliefs that you profess. that your life would match your doctrine. That as, as we profess the gospel, our lives would look like one embodied by, transformed by, informed by the gospel with constant and consistent gospel application. Even just in things like just basic spiritual disciplines, like Jesus is my Lord, and so I'm going to pray to him. I'm going to t- Jesus is powerful. I'm going to take my burdens to him. I, I, I read in script. In fact, his word is in scripture. And so I'm going to go to his scriptures and learn from him. And then as I read his scriptures, I'm going to go and apply what I read in my life. It will cost you. It will cost you your current lifestyle, cost you your comfort. But I promise you it's better. promise you it's better. Uh, Stop pursuing the things you think will make you happy, like people thinking well of you with your carefully curated mask. Stop being a hypocrite and experience the true, unfakeable, life-giving joy from knowing God and being in Him. It's unfakeable joy. It's a joy that doesn't rise and fall depending on your circumstances, depending on your health, depending on what's going on in your relationships. It's unfakeable, unshakable joy. 
bring, like again, jettison hypocrisy. My hope is, as people look in on City Light Church, this church, uh, they wouldn't say of us, these guys are hypocrites. I want to know, I want to know about God. Or, I mean, even those 72% we mentioned before don't want to know more about God because the people who know more about God are hypocrites. So let's be the people who say what we believe, who live in accordance with what we say. And the people who are looking in from outside don't think of us as hypocrites. If they're offended by the gospel, let the gospel be its own offense. But let us not add offense to the gospel by being hypocrites. Let's pray together. Father, you're so good to us. Over and over and over again, you're good to us. You've treated us so far and above anything that we deserve. You've loved us. You've give, you spared nothing, not even your own son, to bring us back to you deal with our unrighteousness and enmity. And so, Lord, uh, the things I want to ask for on behalf of us as a community and us as individual sons and daughters today is that we wouldn't be hypocrites. We would know and live in light of your gospel. wouldn't try to make people think better of us, but that in bringing our weakness and even our sin into the light, people would see the power of your gospel at work in us. I'm sorry for those times we've been hypocrites. We don't want to do this. We want to be people of the truth, always. Speaking it, living it, and inviting others into it. And so, Father, help us to be fruitful in our witness of you, in our, in our being ambassadors of you, um, because we say what we believe, and we, we live what we say. Thank you for the finished work of Jesus. That we don't have to try to present to you some sort of like fake image or, or try to justify ourselves to you, but you have in Christ been both just and justifier. You're such a wonderful, loving God. Help us to live in light of the reality of your love and that our sin has been removed from us. There's no more, no more guilt or shame. Nothing but your love and favor and the righteousness of Jesus upon us. We're asking all these things in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen.